Hello, everyone, and welcome to the DISB Download, an official podcast of the District of Columbia Department of Insurance, Security, and Banking. I'm Jasmine Hicks, Program Analyst at DISB and Manager of the Bank on DC program. And I'm Michelle Hammonds, the Director of the DISB Office of Financial Empowerment and Education. In this episode, we're going to discuss the different ways you can save money for the future and things you'll need to know about credit. We understand that access and financial education is key to financial empowerment and independence. And in keeping with Mayor Bowser's vision, we believe that every Washingtonian has the right to a fair shot through financial education and with it, the ability to make positive financial decisions. So let's get started. Michelle, let's begin by talking about saving money. What are some of the basics of saving and how can folks assess their savings plan? Well, Jasmine, let's first say, saving is simply the process of cutting spending and putting money away in order to guarantee you have the funds available for when you need them later. Assessing your savings can be a very simple plan. Understanding your cash flow and creating an effective budget is all about knowing exactly how much you're earning and also how much you're spending. First, calculate how much money you're bringing in each month and make sure you use your net pay, not gross pay. That is, use the amount you receive after taxes and any other deductions like retirement savings or insurance that are taken out. Next, track your spending. That includes both regular payments you make, like rent and mortgage payments, even insurance payments and other bills, as well as your day-to-day expenses for the things that you buy. Tracking your spending will help you pinpoint areas where you may be overspending and help you identify where you can make cuts. It doesn't feel like you're spending much when you buy a $5 cup of coffee every morning, but you'll easily be able to see how that adds up over time and assess whether you should cut back. From there, set savings goals. Maybe you want to save up to buy a new car or pay off debt. Make adjustments in your spending and or income where you can and stick to your plan so that you can achieve your goals. That's great advice, Michelle. We know that creating savings goals and saving money can feel a little overwhelming. Are there ways to save money automatically that make it easier? Saving automatically is the easiest and most effective way to save money. And there are a few ways you can do it. You can instruct your employer to direct a certain amount of your paycheck into a savings account or retirement fund, or really both. You can ask your HR representative how to do this. You can also choose to direct money from your checking account into your savings account. You can talk to your bank or credit union to set up an automatic transfer every pay period or you can choose a day of the month or regular interval to transfer a set amount between accounts. Of course, a simple way to save is regularly put your loose change in a jar as well. Over time, you can see the coins pile up and you can take that jar to the bank or credit union when it's filled up and turn it into cash and deposit it right into your savings account. There are a lot of saving options out there, including retirement plans like 401k. But arguably, the most important fund to maintain is an emergency savings fund. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of having savings to address emergencies? An emergency savings fund consists of approximately three to six months expenses. You usually will start small, with regular automatic contributions that build up over time. 
We never know when unexpected emergencies will come up in our lives. And unfortunately, most emergencies end up being very expensive, whether they're related to healthcare, transportation, or anything else. Striving to save at least $1,000 for emergencies can allow you to meet unexpected financial challenges without having to take out loans. You can find a calculator on Financially Fit DC to figure out how much you should put away for emergencies based on your income, tax bracket, and other information. And now that I've mentioned it, let me say a few words about the Financially Fit DC program. It's a terrific free online tool that helps district residents assess and enhance their financial well being. Financially Fit DC is driven by a web based financial assessment tool that guides residents through the process of creating a workable budget, managing their credit purchasing a home, planning for retirement, and building wealth. The tool helps users identify short-term needs and set lifetime goals through a personalized financial roadmap. This innovative approach aims to foster behavioral changes that will positively impact individuals and families over the long term. Listeners can access Financially Fit through the DISB website at disb.dc.gov or directly at financiallyfitdc.com. Thank you, Michelle. It sounds like we could all benefit from the financial planning tools that Financially Fit DC provides. I know that saving money can be tricky for those of us with debt to pay off. How does one balance saving money and paying off debt? How do we prioritize the two? This is a really important question, Jasmine, and I'm glad you raised it. How you prioritize your saving and spending really depends on your circumstances. If you have high interest debt, then paying it off should be a priority. It's important to keep your debt from accumulating so much interest that it becomes overwhelming. Make sure you make all your payments on time and pay at least a little more than a minimum amount each month. It will help you pay off your debt as fast as possible. And as I mentioned earlier, having emergency savings can help prevent accumulating future debt. My best advice is to assess your own financial situation and goals, make plans, and keep up with your payments, no matter what you choose to prioritize. You mentioned interest. We know that compound interest can be a very powerful tool for saving money. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. Some of our listeners may already be familiar with interest, where money in an account gains interest based on the initial amount you put into the account. So for example, if you deposit $100 into an account with an annual interest rate of 10%, each year you'll gain $10. Compound interest, however, doesn't just calculate interest based on the initial amount put in the account. It calculates it based on the amount that includes interest. So really, you're stacking money on top of money. So in the example I gave, you'd gain $10 the first year, but then you have a total of $110. 10% of that new amount is $11. So you gain $11 of interest in the second year, totaling $121. Additionally, the more times per year an account compounds interest, the more money you'll be adding into your account. 
It's a great way to save money, especially for young people, because over time, the amount gets exponentially bigger. Thanks, Michelle. That's very helpful. Now, what advice do you have for our listeners when it comes to establishing relationships with banks and setting up bank accounts? Well, one program I highly recommend is Bank on DC. Like Financially Fit DC, it is another DISB program that my office offers. The Bank on DC program is a great resource for district residents who are unbanked or underbanked. The program offers second chance accounts, which help people who have previously had challenges with things like overdrafting or have had checks bounce and may end up on check systems. A second chance account is an opportunity to establish a bank account, even if these problems have existed in the past. Folks can learn more about the program by visiting disb.dc.gov or visiting bankondc.org. Thank you, Michelle. This has all been very practical, useful information on ways to save money and set savings goals. Before we move on to our discussion about all things credit, do you have any final tips you want to share building our savings? I strongly encourage folks to check out financiallyfitdc.com. There are a host of great financial planning tips that include ways to save money on everything we talked about and much more. You can also access additional information by checking out disb.dc.gov. For the second half of our program today, we're going to focus on credit. Let's start out by discussing what exactly credit is. Credit, very simply, is the trust that allows one party to lend money to another party with the expectation that it will be paid back in a timely manner. Does that definition sum it up, Michelle? That is a great way to explain it, Jasmine. Think of credit as the likelihood a friend will pay you back if you lend them some cash. Some people will pay you back the instant they're able, whereas others may take a bit of prodding. Similarly, you can establish good credit with timely payments and understanding that those payments may be with interest. Sounds simple enough, doesn't it? But how do you establish credit in the first place? Credit is established by taking out loans and making on-time payments. Good credit leads to being able to obtain loans. That may sound a bit contradictory, but having good credit helps you build your credit profile. There are easy ways to build your credit when you're starting out, such as securing a credit card. So we begin to establish credit. Tell us about those scary credit scores. What are they and how are they calculated? Credit scores are a representation of your financial history and how risky you are to a lender. It is usually represented as a three digit number that ranges from 300 to 850. Many institutions use your credit score as an indicator of how likely it is that you'll repay your debt in full and in a timely manner. Credit scores are calculated using statistics and mathematical formulas, and they take into account several different things. The most important input into the formula is your payment history. Paying your bills on time is a key factor. The more bills you pay late and the later you've paid them, the worse off your score will be. Credit utilization is the second largest factor and is also known as the amount of credit you use. Additional factors include the length of your credit history, the types of credit you've used, and the frequency with which you take out new credit. Thanks for that overview, Michelle. So we know that having and maintaining a good credit score is important. Can you tell us why that is exactly? And why checking your credit score more often than not is a smart idea? Certainly, a good credit score is instrumental in achieving your financial goals. 
With a good credit score, you're more likely to qualify for loans and at lower interest rates. Whether you're trying to buy a house, a new car, or make home improvements, knowing your credit score gives you a clear assessment of your financial capabilities and helps you to plan your finances. Simply put, keep up with your credit. Now that we've covered credit scores, what's a credit report? How does a credit report, Michelle, differ from a credit score? Jasmine, that's a great question. A credit report is a statement that contains information about your credit activity, like your loan payment history, and the status of any of the accounts you have. Credit reports come from credit bureaus or credit reporting agencies, which collect and store financial data about you that is submitted by your creditors. Creditors, also known as lenders, use these reports to determine whether or not to lend you money, what interest rate to offer you, and or whether you're continuing to meet the terms of an existing account. Other businesses may check credit reports to decide whether to offer you products and services, such as insurance, renting a house, or getting utilities. Credit reports typically contain your personal information, including your social security number, your credit accounts, including account balances and payment histories. Any debts of yours that are in collection or public records like civil suits or bankruptcies. Whereas a credit score is a number that tells you and lenders how likely you are to pay back loans. A credit report is like the itemized version of the score. It shows you your precise credit history. What is the difference between credit scores you'd obtain from services like Credit Karma versus the FICO credit scores that lenders use? Simply put, Credit Karma scores and FICO scores may be calculated differently. Lenders typically use FICO credit scores. They likely will look at the same factors like your payment history, length of credit history, new credit applications, and so forth. But these factors may be weighted differently in the calculation. Credit Karma scores are informational scores and can be a good way to get an idea of what your score is, but it's not official. Wow, good advice, Michelle. Thank you. I'd like to circle back to the topic of credit cards. You mentioned earlier that one way to establish credit is to secure a credit card. Can you tell our listeners how credit cards work? You may be familiar with debit cards which take money directly out of your bank account when you use them. However, credit cards, on the other hand, is borrowed money from lenders such as Visa, MasterCard, or Discover. At the end of the month, you have to pay back all the money you spent using your credit card. If you don't pay it back in full by the due date, you'll have to pay interest on the remaining balance. It can be tempting to make large purchases with your credit card since it's money you're borrowing. But remember, you always have to pay it back. So you don't buy anything with credit that you're not sure you can pay for. Now, before we wrap up, let's quickly go over some common credit issues people may run into and how to deal with them. First, having a good credit score comes from having a good credit history. Michelle, what happens if you have a limited credit history or even no credit history at all? There are actions you can take to build your credit history. As I mentioned, you can take out a secured credit card or a credit builder loan. Making full on-time payments is a helpful way to start building good credit that will be reported to credit bureaus. It's also about showing you're trustworthy as a loan recipient. What happens if your credit application is denied, Michelle? The first thing you want to figure out is why your credit application was denied. 
Lenders are legally required to either tell you the reasons you were denied or at least notify you within 60 days with a copy of the credit report that was used. You should also take this opportunity to review your credit report and correct any errors if they exist. Remember, even small changes in your credit report can help you secure a loan in the future. This has all been very helpful, Michelle. Thank you. Lastly, what should folks do to protect themselves from identity theft and fraud? And what should they do if they think they've been victims? These are all good questions, Jasmine. First, review your credit reports to make sure the only information in them is about you. Report any inaccuracies or suspicious information you find immediately to one of the credit bureaus. If you suspect fraudulent activity, report it and place a security freeze on your reports. Also, notify your lenders and banking partners. Makes sense. As we wrap up our discussion of saving for the future and understanding credit, any final thoughts you'd like to share? Well, as I mentioned earlier, the Financially Fit DC program is a great financial planning resource. There's a large variety of topics you can choose from and plenty of resources, videos, articles, and more to help educate you on your financial journey. And Michelle, what kind of topics? Well, there are resources on credit and saving, but also banking, debt management, retirement, identity theft protection, and much more. You can check out that website at financiallyfitdc.com. But Jasmine, there is also Bank on DC, as I mentioned earlier. Additionally, there are financial education programs available from the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, one called Money Smart for Adults, and from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau called Your Money, Your Goals. Wow, thank you, Michelle. I appreciate your time and all the great information you've shared today. This concludes the department's podcast on saving for the future and understanding credit. For more information about the department's services and resources, visit disb.dc.gov or call us at 202-727-8000. You can also visit bankondc.org to learn more about building financial stability and the partners who help us fulfill our mission. Follow us on social media, including Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Thank you all for joining us, and take care, everyone.